Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. I'm going to be reading more of our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin. Uh, it's called, the subtitle is The Case Against Nuclear Power Plants. And, uh, you know, I've attempted, I, there was a message I wanted to say, but shoot, I keep cussing. And I'm just going to read the book. And then maybe after I've read, I'll be able to spew out what it is I have to say about... Uh, how we're treated as people who are concerned about public health. And so here we are. We are in chapter 12. We're starting chapter 12 on page 265. And here we go. This is the title of the book. It's kind of on my mind. Toward an Adversary System of Scientific Inquiry. The recommendation of a moratorium on the construction of nuclear electric plants is directed towards elimination of a serious hazard to the human species. Of course, it is wise to avert any disaster once it is apparent. But it is relevant to ask why we must approach the brink of disaster so often in the applications of technology. Nuclear electricity is only one case in point, though a profoundly important and dangerous one. The public has every reason to ask why the nuclear electricity industry developed this far be excuse me, the public has every reason to ask why the nuclear in electric industry developed this far before there was a widespread appreciation of the hazards. Why, the public wants to know, was it not warned much earlier that the insurance industry has no confidence in the nuclear electricity generation? How did it escape public notice that nuclear electricity plants represent a gigantic experiment being conducted at the peril of life and property of citizens of the United States. How does it happen that, quote, standards, unquote, for radioactivity exposure, both for routine operations and in the event of accidents, are such as to lead the expectation of massive injury in the form of cancer, leukemia, and genetic diseases? The answers lie in the very nature of large-scale technology. One of, its most, one of its major characteristics is the careful exclusion of the public from all the considerations and decisions. Technologies such as nuclear electric generation espouse that the principle, quote, in such complex problems, we must put all our faith in, quote, experts, unquote. These experts, for several obvious reasons, will surely bring society to its doom unless certain corrective measures are urgently introduced. We shall consider such corrective measures in two areas. A, the need for extensive public participation, and B, the need for adversary assessment of technology. Technologies such as nuclear electricity generation are highly financed operations, usually involving hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. Biological scientists, physical scientists, and engineers are, necess are necessarily attracted to such technologies because of the research and development job opportunities are, are excellent. The experts ultimately chosen to participate in the decision in the decisions concerning safety or lack of it come from these same groups they decide on standards for exposure to the public by to such byproduct poisons such as radioactivity it is axiomatic scientists chosen in this way are not likely to make decisions that embarrass their technology and adverse decisions concerning its hazards can compromise the technology. A standard-setting decision can make the technology itself appear economically unattractive, which might wipe out the scientist's financial support. Consciously and subconsciously, the scientist has a strong motivation to make the technology look good. The result, in general, is that the public hears is that the public bears the burden of any hazards, actual or potential. Such scientists and engineers are not evil in their intentions. This is where me and him disagree. 
However, they are often so thoroughly compromised in outlook that their research for hazards can be characterized as minimum sincere diligence. Let me read that again. However, they are often so thoroughly compromised in outlook that their search for hazards can be characterized, can be best characterized by minimum sincere diligence. At every step in their deliberations, where they must choose, the choice is that which minimizes the hazard estimates. Precise, precisely the opposite choice should be the case if public health and safety were truly of paramount concern. Public health and safety. One product of such scientific deliberations is the concept of an allowable or tolerable or permissible dose of a poison such as radioactivity. Never has anyone proved that any dose of radioactive poison is safe. Yet bodies of scientific experts, duly appointed to standard-setting boards and committees, under the auspicious, auspicious title of radiation protection, such committees proceed to ordain how much radioactive poison the public must accept in order to allow the, quote, orderly development of the technology, atomic or other, unquote. In the course of their deliberations, these committees repeatedly recite the benefits of the new technology and state that society can ill afford to forego them. Next, they estimate the hazards, with all uncertainties weighted for the technology, not the public health, stating all the time that they are proceeding cautiously and conservatively. As an early constructive step, the public could insist upon the abolition of all standard setting bodies. Major decisions concerning exposure of the public to poisons such as radioactivity or other poisonous technological byproducts belong in the public forum. Such decisions, often dealing with effects upon the heredity of the human species, are what we choose to call decisions for all men for all time. A very broad representation of society as a whole must assume active participation in such decisions. How could such a broad segment of society make sound decisions concerning the exposure to a poison such as radioactivity? There are several prerequisites. One, the abolition of experts and standard setters as decision makers. Two, honest presentations of the hazards of byproduct poisons. Three, honest presentations of the benefits of proposed technologies, including serious consideration of alternative methods of achieving the benefits. Four, open forum debate followed by decision either by public vote or vote of public representatives. Five, preservation of the option to reverse decisions. New information concerning hazards and benefits must always be anticipated. Society must preserve the option to change its choice of technology in the light of new evidence. Six, Recognition of the principle that the appropriate permissible dose of man-made poison is zero. Deviations from zero allowable pollution must be allowed only by public decision to be polluted in exchange for some benefit it chooses to receive. Seven, recognition that the burden of proof is upon the technology to prove safety rather than the public to prove hazard, which is where we're at right now. Clearly, the major inputs are two and three, the honest presentations of hazards and benefits. It is to be expected that enthusiastic supporters of the technology will be abundant, simply because dollars are associated with the technology. These proponents will describe the benefits glowingly, they will discover the hazards to be minimal or zero. Further, they will find alternatives to their technology to be non-existent or hopelessly difficult. This all describes the nuclear electricity industry perfectly. 
it is what we can expect for just about any hazardous technology. And this can hardly be described as the kind of balanced presentation required for an open forum decision making by the public or its representatives. The obvious requirement is an assessment of the benefits and hazards by competent scientists and engineers who do not derive their income and support from the technological entrepreneurs, private or governmental. What is needed, therefore, is an adversary system of technology, technologies evaluation. Such adver adversaries must provide the information the technological proponents might fail to provide. The public may be surprised to realize that this essential adversary evaluation of technology is totally lacking in our society. Exactly right. Just why that guy John Ruiz from Oregon State University got a check from Barack Obama the first year out of college for $10 million to start building little nuclear power plants, which, of course, they tell us are not going to hurt us. I'm not going to cuss. Shoving those words back in there. Okay, let's get back to the book. The heavy hand of economic and job reprisal is so well appreciated by scientists and engineers that few actually involved in the technology will speak out against it. We must create a reprisal-free system of adversary assessment. Hmm. We must create a reprisal-free system of adversary assessment. We certainly don't have that. Anybody who speaks out in the nuclear industry sits in the dungeon or in the basement and then, then they end up getting fired. We must learn how to fund such a system so that it cannot be silenced and, or inhibited by the entrepreneurs or their bedfellows in government. Strangely enough, with an adversary system with, excuse me, strangely enough, such an adversary system would cost very little. If it were mandatory that a few percent of the dollars that go into the technology go into funding of technology assessment, the resultant development of sound criticism of technology should be phenomenal. This would give the public a chance for a reasonable open forum debate concerning vital new technological directions. Of course, the sponsors of up-and-coming technology will at first regard it as a thwart. However, with more sober consideration, that I think sober is the operative word. Most of these people are strung out on pharmaceutical drugs, or alcohol, or God knows what. They may very well become major supporters of adversary assessment early in the development of a new enterprise. Unpleasant facts about a technology have a way of ultimately becoming obvious to everyone. The economic cost of realizing them too late can be extremely high. Like right now, this is why we can't do jack about St. Louis. That is why. I think I'm going to stop. I, I can't see the clock over there on my computer, so I have to put my glasses on. Yeah, I'm at 13 minutes. I think I'm going to stop. We're on the top of page 271. And, uh... Put your courage feet on, you guys. Like, we're getting to the real meat. And I, I hope that people use this video. I put all my videos up on this reading as a creative commons. And I hope people will chop them up and cut out the good parts. Because I know, uh, and I appreciate you listening, but I know sometimes it's uh, a little tedious to listen to somebody read haphazardly okay. You know what I mean? I'm not a great reader, but it's better than nothing. I also want to remind people about this book. That's John Goffman's other book. This is a really great book. You know, the other night I said I don't think I'm going to be reading a book, but as I was poking through that one, we're almost finished with this book. Like, seriously, seriously, we're almost done with this book. And I think, I mean, I feel like I'm obliged to read because people need to hear this. I think it helps to get the information out. It helps all of us to understand this information and putting it on a videotape allows people to slice and dice it. I put everything on Creative Commons. 
So I, I feel a strong sense of responsibility that it is time for us to stand up to the nuclear monsters and demand an end to their lies and deception and gaslighting and denial. Um, you know, lately I've started calling them, they act like they're eighth graders who got caught smoking pot in the bathroom. Like they all stand around going, what? It wasn't me. We didn't do it. Like me, I'm not high. You know, I mean, their eyes are all strung out and red. I mean, really? So I hope that this inspires people to take action. That's really what I want. We need to change the paradigm of our elected officials so that they understand nuclear pollution is not just about what are we going to do with the storage. It really is a public health issue, and it is threatening all life on this planet. So put your courage feet on, you guys. Uh, take some action. Call your elected officials. Poke them in the eye. Tell them, please, please do tell them that we need emergency funding for the people of St. Louis, and they need to be moved. Sorry about that, but they all need to be done, and probably the city of St. Louis needs to be shut down. But, you know... They'll just let themselves die first. Anyways, uh, put your courage feet on, you guys, and uh, we got a good year coming up. <laughs> Ciao.